All right, welcome everyone. Uh, we're gonna wait a few moments uh, to have everyone join us uh, in the room. So excited to have you here today, um, wherever you're at, if it's evening, morning, afternoon, glad to have you with us. Um, so we'll, we'll leave a few more seconds just to let everyone come into the space. Feel free to grab some water, coffee, tea, get you know comfy your favorite blanket uh, and excited to talk more today um, not only about Syracuse but some really amazing opportunities uh, to discover and to really explore opportunities related to the built environment uh, and so we'll wait uh, a few more seconds for everyone else to join us uh, excited to have you hopefully it was a much warmer day wherever you were than it was here in Syracuse uh, first day to bust out the winter jacket uh, and so definitely getting excited for the winter it's my favorite time of year here um, and um, hopefully it's going to be a great one this year. It looks like we're reaching our capacity, uh, getting our high number of students coming in. So excited to see that. So I'm going to get started. Uh, my name is Mike McGrath. I'm an assistant director here in the Office of Admissions at Syracuse University. Uh, excited to welcome you uh, to what is our last in our eight part series of academics at Syracuse. Uh, today we're going to be covering the built environment what does that mean what are opportunities to explore and discover that at syracuse university uh, i'm joined by three of my fantastic colleagues uh, who are all going to be sharing more about their individual schools and colleges in just a moment but i'm going to introduce them now uh, the first is uh, dana mcquillan uh, coming from our school of architecture and assistant director of engagement and uh, recruitment there uh, jonathan hoster uh, class of 2002 and graduate class of 2011. I don't know why I know that, but I do uh, from Syracuse University. Uh, so excited he is from our College of Engineering and Computer Science. Uh, and Jenny Saluti, uh, our Director of um, Recruitment and Admissions in the College of Visual and Performing Arts. Uh, so, so excited to have the three of them join today. Uh, before we really dive deep into the program, I do want to provide a brief overview of the university. Uh, if this is the first time you're joining us, welcome. Uh, so excited to have you with us. Uh, you're welcome to share any questions you have throughout this session using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, phone, tablet. Uh, and I'm joined in the back by one of our colleagues, April Lynch, uh, who is from our Chicago office, uh, who will be helping to um, answer these questions as we go along, but we'll leave some time to verbally answer those at the end as well. And so if this is your first time attending a session with Syracuse University, we're so excited to have you. Um, Syracuse was founded in 1870, and in the last 150 years, we really have been a leader in so many ways. Uh, the first school to offer a Bachelor of Fine Arts, um, really innovative when it comes to our programs in architecture, design, engineering, and so many other areas. And what's great about this is you can really customize your academic experience, crafting a curriculum based on your needs and your interests. You have that opportunity to study in so many areas, to take classes across the campus, um, and ultimately maybe pair that one major with a minor, um, really allowing you to explore your interests academically. Syracuse is a research one institution as well. And so in all of these fields, great opportunities to engage with your studies at higher levels, to really put theory into practice, and then additionally, offer awesome opportunities to explore so many areas outside of the United States. Uh, and I know we're definitely going to hit on that as we talk about these areas. Really fantastic opportunities as it relates to our Syracuse Abroad programs, in addition to some fantastic student clubs and organizations to be involved with on campus as it relates to design, to construction, to planning, to architecture as well. Um, Syracuse, if you haven't been, is located in upstate New York, uh, and it is one of my favorite places to be. I am from Massachusetts originally, uh, but I do love Syracuse, and a key part of that is because it really is a beautiful city, uh, and it is such um, an amazing place to be all four seasons, but especially, as I said, in the winter, just to see the city come alive uh, and to see so many great buildings uh, within that space and so many um, beautiful spaces that are not only um, and parallels in their experience, but also just really standing out as true in Syracuse. Uh, and one last thing to just mention uh, when it comes to our university is that we really do bleed orange. No matter where you're joining us from today, be that Massachusetts, California, China, there is somebody there who bleeds orange. We have over a quarter million alumni worldwide who are passionate about their experiences that they've had here on campus and are looking to bring other orange students into the work that they're doing. And a lot of those alumni come from these three schools and colleges. And so I want to let the experts start. Uh, and so I'm going to turn things over first uh, to Dana. 
Um, Dana, why don't you tell me a little bit about the School of Architecture? Thank you so much, Mike. I've never been in a program with you. You do such a nice job. So welcome, everyone. Um, as Mike introduced, I am Dana McQuillan, and I work specifically for the School of Architecture at Syracuse University. Um, I work in enrollment and engagement. So I do recognize some names here. So, so glad to see some of you again tonight. Um, we are a very small program on campus. We have one singular undergraduate degree, and that is the Bachelor of Architecture, the B-Arch. Um, and one minor in architecture. So you do have the opportunity to dabble in our program along with possibly one of the other ones that you're gonna hear from today. Um, again, small faculty um, to student ratios, even smaller as you get older in your studio design classes. And we have approximately 700 undergraduate students throughout our entire five-year Bachelor of Architecture program. So just to break down really quickly, because I know we have a lot of important things to hit tonight, just how our curriculum works. Being a professional degree program, it is a five-year program. And within those five years, you're going to get 157 credits. Out of that, 111 of them are actually going to be in architecture specifically. And the vast majority of them are going to be in specific classes that you have to take sequentially in order to be part of that NAB accreditation to get your Bachelor of Architecture. Um, but you do have some time to dabble in other classes. We have a total of 46 arts and science and open electives, and a lot of them are up to your choice. So it's definitely a possibility to major in architecture and minor in something else. And you'll hear from my colleagues too, that they have lots of minors to offer. So this is definitely where you can start mixing and matching that kind of Mike alluded to during his intro and see what fits for you at the Syracuse University campus, hopefully. Thanks, Dana. I now want to invite uh, our next colleague, Jonathan Hoster, uh, from the College of Engineering and Computer Science to share more about this fantastic college at Syracuse. Awesome, thanks so much, Mike. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us and, and really appreciate your interest in Syracuse. Um, as Mike said, my name's Jonathan Hoster. I oversee recruitment for the College of Engineering and Computer Science uh, here at Syracuse University. You can see the nine uh, degree programs that we have there. Um, certainly some of these are sort of more directly um, engaged with the theme of built environment, civil, environmental, mechanical, electrical engineering, probably for the most um, of this theme tonight, but happy to talk about any of these that you might be interested in. And then um, we have a number of minors as well, and including a, a new minor, uh, actually two new minors. Uh, civil engineering is a very new minor, and the infrastructure cities in the future is, is a very new minor as well, which could fit uh, very nicely with um, if you're interested in these themes of the built environment. So um, about 1300 undergraduate students uh, within the College of Engineering and Computer Science. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, this is an example of um, what the what the curriculum layout would be like. So in things like civil, environmental, mechanical engineering, um, this is sort of the, the rough percentages of, of how you'd be spending your time. So obviously, there's a really important math and science core, um, chemistry, physics, calculus. Um, there's a certain amount of courses that students have to take within the social science and humanities, uh, which you can see here. Um, what we mean by engineering core is like the foundational engineering things like introduction to engineering, CAD, uh, computational tools that happen on the first couple semesters. And then like the core of your major, in this case, um, civil engineering is obviously the bulk of um, what you'd be spending your time doing. So i um, happy to uh, be here tonight. So back to Mike. Thanks, Jonathan. And lastly, uh, Jenny Saluti, uh, love to hear more about the College of Visual and Performing Arts. Thanks, Mike. Happy to. So I focus on School of Design here, but I will give everybody just a very quick rundown. Um, the College of Visual and Performing Arts is home to six undergraduate units. The School of Design is where we'll focus tonight, but we also have a School of Art, School of Music, Department of Drama, Department of Transmedia, and Department of Communication and Rhetorical Studies, um, and School of Art. I can't remember if I said that. Um, so our total college is about 1,800 students. The School of Design is about 400 undergraduate students. We have five different degree programs, a couple of which we'll focus on tonight. Um, uh, we'll focus on environmental and interior design and, and also a little bit about industrial and interaction design. Um, but we do have some other minors and uh, other majors as well that are professional degrees. So environmental design is a four year Bachelor of Fine Art degree program. As you can see here, it's 120 credits and over half of that would be specific to your professional degree. So that includes the first year design core as well as coursework in EDI um, and some other sort of requirements specific to the major. 
you have some electives that are specific to the School of Design and also some academic requirements such as writing and a couple of other things. And then you get some academic electives. Those are yours to do what you will with um, and explore the rest of the university. Our industrial and interaction design major is a five-year program. So similar to architecture and the time that it takes and the uh, sort of amount of effort that goes into all of the different things you have to bring into the degree. And it awards a bachelor of industrial design. As you can see, the breakdown is pretty similar, but you have more credits because you've spent a fifth year. Um, so excited to talk with you more about these things and uh, happy to answer any questions along the way. Thanks, Jenny. So for tonight's program, um, one thing we thought would be really interesting is to talk about what it looks like to be in this area, to be in the built environment. Um, some of you tonight might be seniors, uh, you're already finishing up your applications, others may be juniors or sophomores, thinking about that towards the future. And we really want to help you find your best home. Um, one thing you'll know is I do a lot of puns and that's going to happen throughout our time. Uh, and so uh, to lead this conversation, uh, we thought about doing a case study about one of the buildings on our campus uh, that just opened in 2020, uh, the National Veterans Resource Center. Uh, this is a really great opportunity to talk more about what goes into constructing an environment, uh, the design, the plan of that space, the actual construction of it, and then how to make it implement and work within its environment, in its space, um, and to continue on forever um, as much as it can. Uh, I think that's one thing I love about buildings. Um, not only does it share such a rich history, um, to see someone's perspective of you as well, but to see the way it influences future design, future spaces, um, and really does incorporate into the overall environment. And so that's something I'm really excited to talk more about today. Uh, and so throughout the next couple of slides, we're going to be looking at the different stages of building a space. Uh, and each one of our um, colleagues is going to be leading one of those discussions and talking about how at Syracuse you can learn more about what it takes to create those spaces, um, to be a part of that design, be a part of bringing it to fruition and to life, how we'll prepare you not only through our academics, um, but experiential learning opportunities, study abroad, and internships. And so we're really going to start from the genesis of any space. Uh, and so that is going to be the actual plan, the design. Uh, and so I'd love to have Dana sort of lead this part of our conversation. Thank you, Mike. And that's what hopefully we kind of get out of this constantly. Mike, Jenny, Jonathan, and myself here. Well, I'm interested in this, but what part of this? So hopefully after this, you kind of break down and really start to sense what your interests are at the end of the day. And you might still not know, but we really hope that you explore them more and start to understand the differences from the basics. So from the field of architecture, we're really starting at the ground level as in someone's got to actually come up with this idea. Who is kind of, I call it the creative genius. A lot of times people do think that architecture is all those drafting plans that you would see, you know, the drawing the lines on the piece of paper. Yes, you are going to do some of that, but that's stuff that we can easily teach you. We need you to come in with that creative, creative background. So you start to understand some of those. So you can think of the big picture. You've got to think about outside the box to really envision something like this, like the NVRC, which really was a groundbreaking idea. Um, I think actually something that was really interesting. So the person or the firm that ended up designing this was called Shop. And um, we got to work pretty closely with them while they were actually on campus through the School of Architecture. And I know Greg Pascarelli, who is one of the partners of the firm, he loves to say something about, you know, architects, what are we good at? We're moderately good at everything. You know, we're, we're the generalists, if you will. Throughout your curriculum, you are going to learn a lot about design, but you are going to learn some about structures, some about um, structures that is, and systems, and facades, and interiors, because you've got to know everything kind of surrounding it, so you can put all of the general ideas together for everyone then to work together after that point in time. And Dana, I think a big part of this stage as well is that architects aren't working in a vacuum, right? Um, they're bringing other people in to consult, to talk to. What does that look like when it comes to those conversations that are happening at this stage of the building process? 
So looking at this stage, honestly, everyone is considered, that's a really good point, Mike. So even within a firm, you're going to have a lot of people that have to put their input into making this sort of design it is far from a vacuum. At the end of the day, you are all gonna work together. Um, depending on your firm, some firms even have their own construction part of it. Some are going to have their own interiors, but this is kind of from an architect, it really depends on the firm you're working in, but usually it's the big picture idea kind of starting that phase off. Yeah. Um, and then I, I'm just curious as well, if you wouldn't mind sharing, you know, at Syracuse um, within the School of Architecture, we obviously want to prepare students to start their own designs once they leave to be a part of a firm. What support, what training do they have throughout their five years here on campus? So we are definitely extremely heavy in your design studio work because that is the foundation of what you'd be doing. Studio itself is actually the bulk of your curriculum. It would be 12 hours a week for most semesters that you're with us during your five years. So it is a lot of time, but also within that, you're going to have a lot of collaboration projects just like you would in the firms out and actually practicing those. And you would have classes in structures and in systems. And then we do actually have a lot of hands-on work where you're working throughout different opportunities, especially through your internships that you would be doing during the summers, as well as different opportunities such as our visiting critic studio, which really involves a lot of other local projects or things across um, the spectrum and throughout the globe. One other great example, just to relate it back to campus, we have a visiting critic on campus right now. We're working with some of our fourth year students and they're doing a current case study to help the university get um, more residential housing closer to campus. And they're looking into all of those and they're actually gonna be presenting their findings in the spring. That's really cool. Yeah. And so when a plan comes to fruition, right? When we're, we're ready to break grounds, before that even happens, there has to be conversations, right? We need to maybe do an environmental impact survey. Uh, and, and that's definitely something where we might see somebody like an environmental engineer be part of that conversation. Jonathan, can you talk more about environmental engineering, some of that benefits uh, that Syracuse has, I think definitely of our center of excellence um, to be grounded in understanding space and understanding the impact um, that designing new buildings like this can have on the environment. Sure, Mike, you yeah, have really important part of the process. Um, engineering is all about problem solving. So environmental engineering uh, is really about environmental problem solving. So when you wanna uh, put a new building like the NDRC on this particular area of land, uh, there has to be some, um, I don't know if in inspection is the right word, but um, to see if that if there's any contamination of that, of that land, of that soil. And if there is, then environmental engineers would be the ones that are gonna work to remediate that before the, the building is constructed. And then um, the, the water resources end of this is then sort of the tie-in with um, um, civil engineering. So do you want me to go you know, right into that part of the process as well? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. So um, thinking about this new building and like how is the water gonna get there for the water fountains and how is the, um, how's the water gonna get there for the toilets? Where's the wastewater gonna go when people flush the toilets? So wa water management, water resources, wastewater management, that's um, sort of an overlap between environmental engineering uh, end of things and civil engineering. And then there's many other really important areas under the civil engineering umbrella uh, that are important for a project like this. So the foundation of this structure um, is determined based on what kind of soil is there on this property, what kind of rock is there. Um, so I always joke that our, our civil engineering freshmen um, kind of bellyache sometimes about their uh, earth science class and like, why do we have to, why do we have to learn this? Um, and then it really comes into focus for them when they take a geotechnical engineering class a little bit later on. And geotechnical engineering is that area of civil engineering uh, where you understand the below the ground part of a structure and how you're designing the foundation. And that's based on what kind of rock is there and what kind of soil is there. Um, and then of course the above the ground part is, is, is how I think of structural engineering and really that application of, of math and science to, um, to make this all work and you know, make this a safe place for the people that are gonna inhabit the, the building. And so I, I know, you know, in each of your programs, and I highly encourage everyone tonight to attend virtual programs featuring all of these schools and colleges, because they will go in so much more depth when it comes to this. But Jonathan, I immediately think of the opportunity to travel to Dubai, um, especially as I'm seeing these spaces come to life. Can you share more about that um, summer program? And then I'd also love to hear from Dana and Jenny as well about some of your unique study abroad programs. 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, so study abroad is such a hallmark of a Syracuse education, you know, for all majors and uh, the particular uh, really special opportunity that Mike alluded to is in Dubai. Uh, it's an internship at the Dubai Contracting Co., which is run by one of our alumni. And it's usually about, um, I think, about four weeks in the summer. It didn't happen uh, the past uh, two summers, you know, due to COVID, but we hope it'll be um, back on next summer. And it's a really amazing experience where students visit several different sites. So, of course, in, in four weeks, they're not going to see something start to finish. Um, but they visit some of the sites that the Dubai Contracting Co. is working on that are just at their beginning stages. And then they also visit other sites that the company is working on that are towards the, the, the end point. And so um, our alumni, uh, Mr. Yabruti, who runs that program, you know, really treats the students um, really well to see the sites and, and everything in Dubai as well. Um, so that's just, that's a, that's a summer internship opportunity, but of course there's many um, semester uh, study abroad opportunities for students in, in all these majors as well. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, Dana, I know uh, we don't have a program in Dubai, but I know there's four different options, right? Uh, for students to choose, including New York City, which for many could be studying abroad if they're coming to us from outside the United States. Um, so what are those opportunities? Yeah, so I think the really interesting part of our program, and it all stems from Syracuse University, is that for our students in the spring of their third year and the fall of their fourth year, I use those terms usually because it's a five-year program, um, unless you're going to talk about like super seniors or something, um, but within those two semesters, all of our students will do something global campus related. So say it's the spring of your third year, you would either be in Florence, Italy, London, New York City, or you would be in campus in that visiting critic studio that I talked about briefly before. And then the following semester in the fall of your fourth year, you would actually go to do one of the other four opportunities completely just built into your curriculum. Like it is basically going to happen and you're not gonna skip a beat, which is really great because those are all Syracuse University locations. They're not an exchange student. Really, you know, fact for fact that every credit is going to come in. You're not trying to transfer credits. You have all Syracuse resources at those locations. And then additionally, just to throw this out there, um, our students also have to take professional electives as part of their curriculum. And a lot of those, there's plenty that are offered during the semester, but usually every summer we have some traveling programs that are offered as well. And there was just an information session about one that's gonna be about a month long in the Galapagos this coming summer, which I think is gonna be amazing. That is really cool. Hopefully yeah. they could like swim with the turtles, maybe. That would, uh, it's gotta be something related, right? <laughs> but yeah, they've done lots of other, they've gone to Dubai, they were on sailing on a boat throughout the Mediterranean one summer. Lots of very, very interesting opportunities to get out there and explore. The architect or the built has to see all of the built environment. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, and I know those architecture students aren't alone in Florence and London. They're often joined by VPA students. Um, Jenny, what are the options for VPA students when it comes to studying abroad? Yeah, absolutely. So you're absolutely right. A lot of our design students will go to London and um, study there in the um, you know, environment around them and, and explore in different ways. Um, we have some students that will go to Florence. And then we also have, it's usually taught every other year, um, but some of the environmental interior design students will take a summer, I think it's a summer, a short summer trip um, to Japan and study the very, very different Western spaces, excuse me, Eastern spaces from Western spaces um, and, ex and really dig in and explore and learn about, again, uh, from our point of view, the, the human experience um, when you're in a built environment and really thinking about that uh, and Japan and their culture have a very specific um, and distinct experience with space and environments. And so it's a really unique opportunity. So lots of really great um, choices Places. And just as my colleague said, it's a really wonderful opportunity that is a hallmark of Syracuse University. Our design students also don't miss a beat. Um, the curriculum keeps them on track and, and they can have all of the resources of Syracuse, which again, I think for many of our programs, our peers in any of the programs that we're talking about tonight, it can be difficult to study abroad if you're in a professional degree program because you need the specific classes to keep yourself going. And if an institution doesn't offer that opportunity, it can set you back. So I think that we have some great options for all of our students. 
Definitely. And I know, Jonathan, we talked a little bit about Dubai, which is a special program, um, but I'd love to hear about the, the two other options that I know are really geared towards engineering students in Strasbourg and Madrid. Sure, Mike. Um, there's a just a really great option for freshmen uh, to start their first semester in Madrid, which we call Discovery Madrid. And any student that thinks that's a, a great idea has to check some uh, boxes and it will have you answer some additional questions about that. And you have to be serious about it if you're going to do that, because then we're looking at you as somebody who's going to start in Madrid, not in Syracuse. Um, but you take all the courses that you would take on campus in English. There's no uh, Spanish requirement, um, but there is, um, it's, it's nice to know a little Spanish. I, I was just texting with one of the freshmen who's there right now, uh, exchanged a few messages, and then I switched to Spanish and he kept responding in English. And I said, no quieres practicar conmigo? And he kept responding in English. But um, I do understand he's talking to his host mom in uh, Spanish because she doesn't speak a lot of English. But anyway, his classes are in English. Uh, and then there's really great opportunities in the sophomore year, as you mentioned. Almost any of the engineering students can go to Strasbourg, France, to the Syracuse Center there in the fall of sophomore year, take the classes they need in English. Again, there's no French requirement. And then Florence, Italy works really well for, I would say, about half the engineering majors in the spring of sophomore year um, to take the classes need, that need there. Again, no language requirement, the courses are in English. And then there's a number of other partner programs where we can send students to places like Dublin and Sydney um, to get the courses they need, again, in certain majors. So everybody who does this loves it. And I personally highly, highly recommend it. Yeah, it sounds like studying abroad for an engineer is really fluid. <laughs> it is very good. <laughs> um, <laughs> speaking of, transitions. Uh, one thing I, I do love about the NBRC, um, we recorded all of this. We wanted students, we wanted alumni, we wanted just people who are interested to see the space be built. And so I will be sharing towards the end a link to the actual videos if you want to see the space come together um, over the three years. Uh, it was actually right outside my window in my office and it was kind of cool to, to see it come together at the university. Um, but a big part of designing the space was seeing how we would interact with the human experience. And I know, Jenny, that's such a key part, as you mentioned, of some of the programs in BPA. Um, not only does the space exist, but it has to be used, it has to be utilized, um, and it has a purpose. And can you talk a little bit more about the role that an environmental and interior designer would play or an industrial designer would play in creating some of these spaces um, and really bringing these ideas to life in a new way? Absolutely, I would love to. And I do think that the main um, sort of most important takeaway when you're thinking about which part of this um, built environment might be the piece that's really the great fit for me is to think about um, you know what it is that you're passionate about and so from the design school of design perspective it really is all about the human experience the empathy of um, how someone will experience a space and um, engage and interact with that interior space although it is sometimes exterior space as well Um, is going to fit or um, use and move through the space that the architects um, had the big picture idea about and that the engineers made safe for us to um, move around inside. And actually, while although we're looking at a space that it, you know has a beautiful auditorium and some great exhibition space and gorgeous light, um, good hallways where you really can get a sense of awe. Um, our students are thinking about all kinds of spaces. So that interior could be anything from a, a beautiful building like this um, to the interior of a car. Um, we could be thinking about um, homes that people live in or um, hospitals that are more institutional. Um, but the key is really thinking about how that space is gonna be used, who is gonna use it, and how are we going to um, make the impact to uh, help people use it in the best way and have the best experience. Um, so the interior, environmental interior designers certainly thought about um, how people would enter this beautiful auditorium. How are we gonna, uh, set up the movement and the flow of how people um, enter and exit, 
how they move around their seats and how they experience the space while they're seated as well as while they're moving around and coming in and out. Um, someone had to think about acoustics. Um, we have a great shot here of an exhibition along the windows and there are exhibit designers that are thinking about um, what kind of information, history, um, et cetera, might we wanna share and how are we going to let people engage with that so that it, it fits within the space as well. It, it isn't just about, uh, you know, one thing or the other, but how do they flow together? Um, hopefully that's that's a good starting point. Oh, well, the industrial designer might have designed the actual chairs that the people are sitting in um, within the auditorium, right? So all of those different components are being thought of. And, um, and I think it is really, really cool to think about how the three presented here today really do interact and intersect um, and that it is a collaborative effort. No one person could do all of these things or have the expertise or experience to bring all of it together alone. And so I think that idea of collaboration is really important to highlight as well. And I would just note that at Syracuse University, I think it's a really collaborative environment. So it really leaves uh, room for you to have that experience while you're in school, even though you will choose one particular area of focus, um, as we mentioned earlier, through minors or electives or even clubs, um, you'll really have a chance to kind of put some of these things that you'll do in the real world to the test while you're a student. Jenny, and I mean, that is such a key part of all of this work. It's collaborative. It is not one person who's taking something from the, the idea, the genesis to its construction, to making it live and thrive in its environment. There are so many voices, so many ideas, and so many people a part of that journey. Uh, and so that's true today as you're looking at buildings, as you're looking at spaces and you're excited by this. Maybe you're somebody who played with Legos, was obsessed with The Sims, whatever it was that made you interested at the beginning. Maybe you just love art or you love building spaces with popsicle sticks. Um, we want to support that and help you explore what is going to be the right place for you, right? If you're somebody who gets excited and thrilled by actually the construction of it, maybe something in civil would make the most sense, right? If you're somebody who's most excited by how do I take what's in my head and bring it into life, that's something I know architecture is such a key part of. Um, if you are really looking at spaces and trying to uncover how can this work in today's society, in this space, in Syracuse, New York, that's something that designers are a big part of. And so we're excited to talk more about that today and how these programs complement. Um, because in this space, I look, say this natural wood that's being used, there were so many people who were part of that process, right? There was environmental engineers, civil engineers. It wasn't just the architect that came up with this and then slapped it on a wall, right? And then ultimately when it's there, we have environmental designers working to make sure it can work in that space and how to complement it. Um, and so, so excited a little bit more about how these programs can complement each other. Um, can I jump in? Yeah, I, I, you made me think of something again that I think we all have in common and that is a real um, passion, but also responsibility for sustainable engagement as well. So um, I know that all of, all of the programs that my colleagues are talking about um, feel the same way, but I can say certainly for the School of Design, sustainability is at the very forefront of everything that they do. And so I think that that's important to know as well, right, that our students are not just um, thinking about what will be cool or what will look great, but also what will um, not have a negative impact on our world and our environment moving forward, how we can use resources wisely, um, how we can choose materials that are sustainable when, um, when we make decisions. And so I think that that's an important part as well and something that definitely is um, across the board. Absolutely. Jonathan or Dan, is there anything else you want to share when it comes to sustainability? Because that is such, um, not just a buzzword right now, but has always been a key part of this. But I think there's more understanding of the need to be sustainable when it comes to creating spaces. 
And I think it's absolutely true. And that's part of where I feel like most of the programs, especially I would say our better programs, our great programs, it should all just be woven into your curriculum. My one thing I usually tell students is don't go out there searching for the word like sustainable, sustainable, sustainable. It doesn't need to be in the title. These great historically good programs are really going to teach you that throughout threads of the curriculum that are just going to make it all make sense at the end of the day, because as the architect, as the engineer, as even the interior designer, environmental designer, you are the stewards of the earth. You are the people that are sort of setting us up for that better future. And you always have to be one step ahead of everyone else. And honestly, just to throw something else out there and I'll let Jonathan speak too. We're all designing for clients too, to a certain extent. So you are a face of things, you know, like, so the architect was hired for Syracuse University, things like that. So there's a lot of interpersonal skills between all of us as well. But sorry, Jonathan, did you have anything else about sustainability in Mike's question? No, yeah, Dana, I was going to just, um, everything you said was um, was right on point. I mean, the fact that um, sustainability is not necessarily in the name of the class, but it's it's, it's interwoven in, into everything we're doing. I definitely agree with everything you said there. Um, and I wanted to um, give everybody that link to the um, Syracuse Center of Excellence, which um, Mike mentioned earlier, is a, is a really great research center um, that is um, just a couple blocks uh, from the Syracuse campus, and it's on the bus route, so it's easy for students to get there. There's no classes there. But there's some really, really fascinating research there. And, and most of that research, um, the, the big overarching theme is sustainability. Um, and um, it's called the Center of Excellence in Environmental and Energy Systems. So um, check that out. If you're interested in research, um, Syracuse is a research one university. And there's some really, really incredible opportunities for students to do research across all of these disciplines. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm just so excited to, to answer the questions that have come through. I know uh, we'll give you some time if you have any additional questions. I do want to start with three that we can kind of talk about. Um, the first is, and we, we've already highlighted this a little bit, what are opportunities to pursue these programs across the schools and colleges? Um, and I, I will say, uh, as those of you who are maybe trying to determine what is your best fit, looking at these programs, know that some of them um, may not be possible to double major, right? But there's definitely still opportunities to take classes, to do a minor. Uh, and I see both Jenny and Dana shaking their head because their programs are probably some of the most uh, intensive when it comes to the work because they're professional degree programs, right? You're leaving with a terminal degree in many cases. Uh, and so Jenny, I don't know if you want to kind of start with how you see students in VPA um, explore some of the opportunities in engineering and architecture. Sure, absolutely. So for students that sort of ultimately find that the School of Design is their main home, um, but have those other interests, absolutely. Our EDI students are minoring in architecture. Our industrial design students might be minoring or taking courses in engineering. Um, and uh, I think some of the ways that they get engaged uh, interdisciplinarily is that a word? Um, are also through some of the extracurriculars. And I'll let Jonathan talk a little bit more about um, Invent at SU, but it's something that both engineering students and design students really engage with and allows them to pursue sort of these multiple interests um, in a new place that's actually outside of the classroom. Um, and we've had lots of design students that engage and do great and, and really build a a concept of a product um, from from that concept to production. Um, so those are cool ways to and Syracuse because of the research, because of the um, focus on experiential learning, uh, our students are getting all of that both in the, and outside of the classroom. So hopefully that helps. Jonathan, uh, since Jenny kind of called you out, would you want to go next uh, to share more about how students in engineering uh, can explore opportunities in architecture and uh, BPA? Yes, sure. I'm just uh, throwing this link in the chat as well for everybody. Uh, so yeah, this is one of my favorite programs to talk about. Invent at SU happens in the summer. Um, it has to happen in the summer because students are really focused on it for those six weeks. And what they're doing is designing, prototyping, and pitching an original invention. And as Jenny mentioned, um, this program is typically uh, populated mostly by design students and engineering students, but it's open to the whole campus. And actually, one of the best parts of this is that, um, and, and this summer, um, Dr. Manfredi, who's a design professor who ran the program, um, insisted that the teams are interdisciplinary. And so I think that was a, a really great improvement to the program. And so you had teams of three students where one is a designer, one's an engineer, one's a physics major, 
Um, and that just um, really elevated what was possible when they put their put their expertise together. So the winning invention this summer was um, uh, called Sweatration. It's a wearable device that monitors for dehydration. Uh, the program starts with an ideation situation where students are, are brought through a process by the professors thinking about what's a problem in the world and what's a tangible invention that we can, we can design and invent to solve that problem. And so they do that over six weeks, they pitch it to judges, they get feedback. Some of the teams win prizes, um, but at the end of that six weeks, a lot of the teams aren't done. They, they are very invested in this and they wanna keep going. And so they connect with the resources at the Blackstone Launchpad, which is Syracuse's hub for entrepreneurship, which is in our library. And the folks there connect them with the legal aspects of patenting their device, the legal aspects of starting a business and where else they can go really nationwide to pitch these inventions and win more money towards them. And I will say there's, I think, three big benefits of this. Uh, one is you have a tangible invention, which is pretty cool. Two is it's an amazing resume builder. I've had a number of students who have done this program who have told me basically the same story that once this was on their resume and they went to apply for internships and jobs at companies, companies told them the reason we selected you for this interview for this position was because you had this invention thing on your resume and it made you different than everybody else's resumes that we were looking at. And then in those interviews, usually they want the student to talk a lot about the invention, which is really easy for them to do because they had been living and breathing it uh, for a long time uh, up until that point. And my number three is public speaking skills and confidence. And it doesn't really matter where students start in that regard. If they begin this program and they're already confident about public speaking or they're nervous about public speaking, they get better because they have to do these pitches every week to their peers, professors, and um, and judges. So it's a really, really awesome program. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, and, and Dana, you know, Bachelor of Architecture, five-year program, 111 core credits. How can a student fit in something else? <laughs> I know, it's crazy. But to tell you, most minors are only 18 credits for the most part. So there is definitely time to minor in other things. And this is where I'll also highly encourage our students in the room. If you have any opportunities to take college level courses, AP, IB, dual enrollment type things, especially for those seniors in the room, this is another push to try and do well on those your senior year. Don't let that senior slide happen because those all, if they come in for credits here, allow you a lot more flexibility and time in your curriculum to take things at the varying places, especially those open electives. Because I even have students that are, you know, minoring in performing arts and different like um, instruments and things like that. That's just amazing. And I love to see their creative nature across the spectrum. And it's also reminded me to kind of thinking a little bit back to that sustainability conversation. Um, the university in tandem with SUNY ESF, one of those New York State University schools, has um, a team called the Solar Decathlon Team. Because every year the US um, Department of Energy holds a competition for different colleges. Um, working on kind of those invested projects, how to push the envelope, if you will, um, thinking towards the most high performing, efficient, affordable, innovative buildings that we can and really leverages the opportunities to showcase the students innovation. Um, in 2019, um, we have students that partnered from SUNY ESF from the School of Architecture, as well as from I'm trying to think of other programs. I think it was construction management, environmental and mechanical engineering, landscape architecture, all came together. And in 2019, they actually won the design competition. In 2020, they did receive honorable mentions as well, even though it was online that year. So just so many good things that are happening on campus to whatever your interests are to pursue. That's where yet again, you have the ability to meld your own way, to make that own way of whatever interests you. There's so many different avenues that you could intertwine them with engineering, with visual and performing arts, with SUNY ESF, whatever it may be your thing per se, even if it is those other clubs and activities that you're involved in. It's huge, there's over 300 recognized clubs and student organizations at Syracuse, you know, whatever your thing is. And I think it's key too, and you kind of highlighted, you're not limited just to these three programs to take minors in, right? Um, if you want to explore another language, um, we talked a little bit about ESF, there's opportunities to do minors there in landscape architecture and environmental science, um, you know, highlighted the need to be able to speak to others. Uh, minor in communication rhetorical studies may be a great opportunity for you to have some public speaking background. Um, so many ways to really expand upon your education 
at Syracuse. And we really want to help you in that process. And we have a question from Lisa Jenny um, asking if they aren't sure which area of design, what should they do? Oh, that is a really good question. Um, if you're not sure which area of design, but you're really excited about design, um, Unfortunately for the application, you have to pick one of the majors so you can apply into the School of Design. But I will say that this is pretty unique to Syracuse University. We have a distinctive design core. This is the first year experience for our design students. And that is pretty um, universal for all of the design majors. So what's exciting is that you'll, you'll be able to focus in on some design core skills right away, drawing for design specific specifically um, uh, problem solving, you're going to take design thinking, you're going to do some things that really get you up to speed with just big picture design ideas. But you in the second semester would take a course specific to the major that you're thinking about, the one that you typically that you've applied to. But you can add on another elective for that 100 level course in a different design major. And if by the time you finish the first year, you've really changed your mind about one of the other majors, you can move around pretty seamlessly. So even if you're unsure, um, I would say, contact me, we can talk through details, but you would want to pick one of the majors, and then um, have the opportunity certainly to explore a little bit in that first year. Thanks, Jenny. I kind of want to move into to this next question because I know all of you have some things you're looking for when it comes to an applicant. Uh, and you definitely go in depth in your own sessions. And I'm going to again encourage students attend some of these amazing virtual programs that go into depth of what we look for in portfolios, in students uh, as they're applying to Syracuse. Uh, but maybe starting with Jonathan, um, when you're reviewing an applicant to engineering, is there anything that's kind of key? Uh, for that student that they should be aware of, um, especially for our juniors who are maybe looking uh, at finishing up their senior year and what classes they may need to pre-schedule as they're looking at that uh, program. Yeah, great, uh, great discussion, Mike. Um, math and science, strong math and science background, definitely uh, for anybody interested in engineering. Uh, we expect students have completed pre-calculus by the time they graduate high school. And if somebody is taking pre-calculus as a junior, then we would hope they take calculus when they're a senior. Calculus is not required for admission to engineering, but if you have a chance to take it in high school, certainly you should do that if you think engineering might be uh, the right path for you. And then definitely a strong background in science, chemistry, and physics, I would say the most important amongst the sciences. So those are the things that we sort of heavily scrutinize um, when we're looking at students' applications. We don't have a lot of like super specific curricular requirements beyond that because we know that different high schools offer different uh, menus of options. So um, certainly if your high school offers advanced courses in these areas that you can take in AP Calc or AP Chem or Physics then, or, or a dual enrollment in some of those areas, certainly we would encourage you to do that. Um, but following up on Mike's point about virtual sessions, I put a link in the chat there that will show you all the engineering virtual sessions. Um, some of the dates have passed now, um, but we do almost every Tuesday, there's an engineering overview session at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern, and we still have some sample classes left uh, for the remainder of this um, uh, of this semester. So there's uh, next uh, month, there's one on aerospace engineering, there's one on climate change, there's one on computer vision. So um, in each of those sample classes, it's just one hour on a particular weeknight. So not a huge commitment, but a, but a neat way to connect with our faculty. Thanks, Jonathan. Jenny, uh, when students applying to the School of Design, do they need anything? Do they just need an application? Or is there something else they need to submit? Thanks, Mike. You gave it right to me. They do need um, a portfolio if they're applying to any of the Bachelor of Fine Art degree programs or the Bachelor of Industrial Design. If they're applying to the Bachelor of Science and Design Studies, it does not require a portfolio, but you would still have the opportunity to start in that first year core, like I explained. And if you decided and did, if you did well in that core and really wanted one of the professional BFA, BID degrees, you could move potentially into that. But the BS is um, is a little different and um, it focuses more on sort of the intersections between design and other things, whether it be engineering or business, um, probably even architecture and sort of how those things come together. So it has more of an academic bend. In terms of the portfolio for design, some students have a traditional art experience in high school, and that is absolutely great. Um, that would be a traditional portfolio where we're looking for 12 to 20 pieces. Um, we're very interested in process for the School of Design. So if you're submitting a portfolio, 
for the School of Design, we'd love for you to include um, images that show that process. We want to know how you're thinking. We want to know how you're working through a problem. Um, and that process shows that. It doesn't mean that everything has to show process, but if you have some ability to share some uh, pieces that, that demonstrate that um, thinking and the process, that would be great. Um, we also have what's called an alternative portfolio. And this is for students that are really getting excited about design, but maybe didn't have a full four years of art in high school because they didn't realize they were interested in design until their junior year. Um, and this is a, an assignment based portfolio that allows students to follow three prompts and I won't get into the details they're all on our website and you can contact me if you have questions, but there's three prompts so we give you sort of a problem and we want to see how you're going to solve it. And so that is a way for students that maybe don't have, um, you know, 20 drawings, paintings, ceramic pieces um, to show us to still um, give us some creative ways of solving problems and be considered for the professional programs. Thanks, John. And Dana, um, architecture definitely has a different portfolio that they're looking for. And that's one thing for students. If you are looking at both programs in architecture and uh, the School of Design, you'll have to submit separate portfolios. Uh, and so Dana, can you talk a little bit about what we're looking for in the School of Architecture? Thanks, Mike. Yes, we do also require a portfolio. And I know I've seen some of these names here at our portfolio development workshop. So thank you for continually attending these events. Um, for the School of Architecture, there is only one step. There's not two options for submitting a portfolio. It is one portfolio of 12 to 24 pieces. And our only requirement is you must include observational drawings. So for the School of Architecture, we're really trying to see, can you get those thoughts from your head to your hand, to your medium, your piece of paper or whatever else you're working with? Can you make that translation from idea to something tangible? Because that is really what this professional degree is all about and what this field is all about. And we wanna make sure that you're gonna be successful in our program. Really, at the end of the day, we want this to be a good fit for you. And I don't want you to be sitting in studio class and your professor is sitting here and we're looking and we're saying, Jenny, hi, Jenny, how are you doing? I, you know, I, I keep hearing what you're saying. I do, but I'm not seeing it. Can you make that translation into something tangible? You can have all these great ideas, but you need to get them out. And, you know, if I ask you for something real, I kind of know what it's supposed to look like too. So we can really put a good judgment on that. So that is our real focus for our portfolios. That needs to be a bulk of them. Other than that, you are welcome to submit other things, um, you know, sculptures, model making, photography, anything that's tangible, but the focus does need to be in those observational drawings. Thanks, Dana. I want to wrap up and if you have additional questions, you're welcome to submit them, but we'll have our contact information just on the second uh, on the screen, but for the three of you, in a sentence, I'm not going to say one word, Jonathan, in a sentence, um, can you say what makes a student successful within your school or college? Uh, and so uh, why don't we start with the order we did tonight, Dana, what makes a student successful in the School of Architecture? I should have thought about this further in advance, Mike. Um, I think our most successful students are those who are extremely creative, but very good with time management and details. Jonathan, in the College of Engineering and Computer Science, when you are seeing students who are successful, what are some of the qualities that you're seeing? I think um, one of the most important pieces of advice I give to students is they have to ask for help when they need it. And um, some of them struggle with that and aren't willing to do that. But uh, the most successful students are the ones that are seeing their professors during office hours, going to see their advisors, having study groups with their friends, signing up for academic workshops for reinforcement. Um, those are all uh, qualities of a highly successful college student. And at the same time, you know, some of the students that we don't see a lot, some of the students that are ghosting us are the ones that aren't, aren't as successful. Um, and so putting in that effort, asking for help when you need it uh, is really, really important. That's my best piece of advice I can give to everybody. Thanks, Jonathan. And Jenny, do you want to wrap us up? When you look at a student in the College of Visual Performing Arts, what are some of those key qualities you see when it leads to success? Absolutely. Uh, we're definitely looking for students with a curiosity and a passion to make a difference in the world around them. Thank you so much. Um, like I said, we're here to answer your questions. Um, you're welcome to contact any of us um, as you have questions, as you're looking at Syracuse, um, if you're looking at some of these programs specifically, 
we really want to help you along this process um, as you're trying to find that college that's going to grow you, shape you, and help you become the best version of who you can be. I really do think Syracuse can be that place for you. I know it was for me, uh, for Jonathan, who's another undergraduate alum. Jenny is a graduate alum, um, quarter million alumni worldwide who really did learn what it meant to become Orange. And so I wanna thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, please be in contact with us as you have those questions, attend our virtual programs, get to know us better, and really find what's going to be your best fit. Have a great evening and go orange.